Ezekiel chapter 22. Ezekiel chapter 22. Lamentations, Ezekiel. We're going to begin in verse 23 this evening in Ezekiel chapter 22. <clears throat> Looking at verse 23. The Bible says, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto her, Thou art the land that is not cleansed, nor rained upon in the day of indignation. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion ravening the prey. They have devoured souls. They have taken the treasure and precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. <clears throat> her priests have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and profane Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean, and have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profaned among them. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey, to shed blood and to destroy souls to get dishonest gain. And her prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar, seeing vanity, and divining lies unto them, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord hath not spoken. The people of the land have used oppression, and exercised robbery, and have vexed the poor and needy, yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge, and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Therefore have I poured out mine indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word of God that we have just read. And I ask you, sweet Holy Spirit of God, to take the truth of the word and make it real to our hearts and applicable in our lives. I ask you to forgive me of my sins and fill me with thy spirit. Please help me to be able to preach and teach the word of God with truth, without any heresy. And as your word goes forth, that it would land on fertile ground and produce fruit. Dear Lord, once again, we do lift up those on the prayer list. We lift up America. We lift up churches. We lift up Christians. We lift up the preachers. Amen. And dear Lord, we just pray tonight that as the gospel goes forth, that, uh, dear Lord, it would encourage saints save sinners and dear god that it would exalt the savior help us now dear lord please place a hedge of protection about this church and this ministry and this service this evening we claim the blood and we ask it in the name of jesus amen, amen. ezekiel is a prophet who preached and prophesied uh, during the babylonian captivity of Israel and uh, he was a young man he would probably be <clears throat> 30 30 ish he was one of the, the priests as the beginning chapters would, would tell you that Jeremiah had preached before and right before that they had gone into captivity continued preaching to the people about uh, their sins and about repentance and about judgment of God that it's coming. But as you know and you understand the story, uh, they didn't listen. And they held on to their sins and uh, they went into captivity. God allowed that. In fact, God used that. And they went into the Babylonian captivity. It's going to be a 70-year uh, captivity. And the Bible tells you why that they went. And Ezekiel is a prophet, priest, preacher, if you want to use that, that uh, preached to them while they were in captivity. Now think about it. They're already in captivity for their sins, 
and for disobeying God, not uh, respecting the Sabbath. They were to respect the Sabbath and so forth, but out of, out of gain, and you know how people's hearts are. They were to let the land lie fallow or not till and, uh, every Sabbath and so forth. But they didn't listen. They wanted the extras. And so uh, God put up with it long enough. He said, okay, well, when you're in captivity for 70 years, the, the land's going to enjoy the Sabbath or the rest. And uh, you say, and I would say, well, we, we don't sin in that regard. Well, we got other sin. And God warns us and so forth. But uh, Ezekiel is preaching to them while they're in captivity. Now, the, the, the judgment's already fallen, and, and uh, God's still having this man preach and prophesy to him. Now, I want you to consider that. It, it's because you had Jeremiah preaching before they went into captivity. They went into captivity for their sin. And now Ezekiel's preaching to them while they are in captivity. And, and what it indicates to you and I, and what it illustrates to you and I, that, that God raises up, God calls, God puts men in the ministry of preaching the gospel. God lays it on their heart uh, to preach to the people, whether it is in a time of ease or whether it's in a time of trouble, whether it is in a time of freedom or whether it's in a time of bondage. God knows that his people need preaching and God provides the preaching and it is up to the individual, the person, to listen to it and then to receive it and to act upon it. And Ezekiel is that, that man during this time. He's preaching to them. Uh, tradition would say that he, he died there at the hands of those that he preached to. Now, I, 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 wouldn't, I don't know that. I'm not dogmatic about that. But uh, it, just, it stands to reason that there's a whole lot of people that don't like preaching, though God has chosen that. And even amongst the children of God, and it's a shame, it's, it's what they need. They need to hear the preaching of the Word of God, and they need to listen to it, they need to respond to it. Well, uh, in verse uh, 30, as we've read this portion, this is what uh, God says. He says in verse 30, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge, and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, that it would not destroy the land, but I found none. Did you see that? That's my thought this evening of making up the hedge and standing in the gap. If you look back at this and just notice a few of these verses, in verse 29, you see the condition of the land. The Bible says, the people of the land, verse 29, have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. It was, it was a bad condition of the land. In fact, if you look back at this chapter, you know, I want you to notice in verses 2 through 4, just for a moment, about the condition of the land. He says in uh, verse 2 of chapter 22, now thou, now thou son of man, wilt thou judge? Wilt thou judge the bloody city? That's how God sees that, the bloody city. Yea, thou shalt show her all her abominations. Then say thou, thus saith the Lord God, the city sheddeth blood in the midst of it, that her time may come and maketh idols against herself to defile herself. Thou art become guilty in thy blood, for thou hast shed blood and hast defiled thyself in thine idols, which thou hast made, and thou hast caused thy days to draw near, and art come even unto thy years. Therefore have I made thee a reproach unto the heathen, and a mocking to all countries. I want you to notice that thought where God made them a mocking to all countries. I think today that we as in America are being mocked of countries. And in, in this, this new, um, thank you, that's the word I was looking for. When you've got a transgender that's in this 
office, if you will, or position, and uh, head of the, the health, that's a mocking. And, and, and people mock that. What happened to America? Strong. It's still the greatest country. I understand that. But uh, the average individual knows better than that. <coughs> you, you don't have to be a Christian to know better than that. And, and that's a mocking. And, and, and God, if you study the scripture, allowed Israel and the Jews to become a byword. You've read that before. As powerful as they were, he allowed them to become a byword. That's when we say Jews, a byword. And that's what's happening in, in America. You, you notice that. The condition is bad. The condition was bad. It, it's bad. You have to make application. Uh, notice in this chapter, of chapter 22 again in uh, verse 7. In thee have they set light by father and mother. In the midst of thee have they dealt by oppression with the stranger. In thee have they vexed the fatherless and the widow. Thou hast despised my holy things and hast profaned my Sabbaths. That's one of the reasons they went into captivity is that God said to obey the Sabbath. And they said, we're not going to obey the Sabbath. And uh, they're making light of parents. They're oppressing the stranger, vexing the fatherless, profane the Sabbath. They made light of God's holy things. Look at verse 10. Here is all immorality amongst the people. In thee have they discovered their father's nakedness. In thee have they humbled her that was set apart for pollution. And one hath committed abomination with his neighbor's wife. And another hath lewdly defiled his daughter-in-law. And another in thee hath humbled his sister, his father's daughter. This is all sorts of immorality that they've committed. And so you see the condition of the land. In verse 30, I want you to notice this. There is the call of the prophet or the call of a person, the call of a man, the call of someone. Verse 30, and I sought for a man among them, amongst the populace, amongst the population, as God looks down on the children of men, and he sought for a man. There is the call. God is seeking a man to stand in the to gap. To make up the hedge. In other words, does, does anyone, is, is there anyone that looks at this and says, we are a, a mocking, and is there anyone concerned enough that would say, I want to stand in the gap. I want to make up the hedge. Uh, here, my Lord said me, or I'm concerned enough with that. There is the call of the prophet. In verse 31, you have the condemnation of the people because God saw none. The Bible says that God is going to pour out his indignation. Therefore, have I poured out my indignation upon them. Why? Because the call went out. If anybody's interested in spiritual things, if anybody's interested in lifting up prayer, if anybody's interested in in standing in the gap and making up the hedge, and you know it's bad, and you know we ought to do something, but instead of just talking about it, is anybody interested in uh, getting involved? And God said, I didn't find any. I, I, I did call, and uh, he calls from the pulpit. He calls from the Word of God, and he calls. And he, he, he calls. The condemnation is that nobody responded. I know it's bad, preacher. I know it's bad, but uh, it, it's not going to be me. And so uh, the Bible says that he poured out his indignation. And then there is a consumption, verse 31, I have consumed them. It, it, it means that not just chastening upon them, but there was a consumption of them with the fire of my wrath. People consumed in God's wrath. The country consumed in God's wrath. The city consumed in God's wrath and so forth. And then there is this compensation for evil. You know, the wages of sin. That's a compensation. The wages of sin is death. Verse 31, the Bible says, 
and I, uh, well, I have recompensed upon their own heads, their own way, the way that they've been living, the way that they've been sinning, the way that they've not responded. Their own way have I recompensed upon their own heads, saith the Lord God. This is turning their sin upon their own head. This is the sowing. This is the reaping. This is the response to the people. You give them whatever that they want. I, I want to say with this, though, you, you see the call of the the, you see the condition of the land and the, the call of the prophet, the condemnation of the people, the consumption by wrath and compensation for evil. But I, I want to say this, and this is the body or the thought of the message, the Christian who will stand in the gap. The Christian who will stand in the gap. That's the title, that's the thought. Making up the hedge and standing in uh, the gap. Uh, America is guilty of every sin of that chapter if you read it in depth. We have sunk into a new low of immorality. And we are guilty of disobeying God, of blood and oppression. Uh, we're, we're guilty of all of that. And we are currently experiencing the beginnings of the wrath and judgment of God. We are experiencing that. And it will ramp up. And I, I believe that God is still looking for Christians who will make up the hedge and stand in the gap. And I believe that every uh, God-called, Bible-believing preacher that stands behind a pulpit preaches every week to people about this message. That you and I ought to be involved in this. And, and we could sit around and talk about how bad it is at McDonald's over coffee. But they may not let you in there right now. But it's, it's the Christian who could do something about it. The, the lost person probably won't. And the Christian definitely should. There are men throughout the Word of God that were singular, if you want to put it in that, as far as numbers go that made up the hedge and stood in the gap. Because the individual Christian automatically says, I'm just one. But Abraham, on behalf of his nephew Lot, and you already know the story, so I won't go there, but it is Genesis 18, 23 and following, if you want the reference. It's Abraham, when uh, the Lord God, uh, Jesus, a Christophany, pre-incarnate Jesus, showed up to Abraham with two angels and announced uh, here's the positive you are going to have a son and uh, also we're going to bring judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah that's where your nephew is we're going to rain fire down on that why because their sin has come up and Abraham hearing that he stood in the gap and you know that story that he prayed Lord if there's 50 you, you won't destroy the city for 50 righteous, will you? And the Lord said he wouldn't. And it went 40 and 30 and 20 and 10, and the Lord left off, Abraham left off, and so forth. Well, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah got destroyed by fire. And Lot was brought out, and so forth. But Abraham, he stood, he made up the hedge, and he stood in the gap for his family and you can do that you, you can do that judgment is coming to all lost people and knowing that Abraham made up the hedge he stood in the gap for his nephew Lot uh, Moses look at this for just a moment in Psalm 106 for just a moment Moses he made up the hedge and he stood in the gap Look at Psalm chapter 106. In Psalm 106 and in verse 23. In Psalm 106 and in verse 23, the Bible says, Therefore he said that he would destroy them, had not Moses, his chosen, stood before him in the breach. 
to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them. He's talking about God that announced that he was going to destroy the people. And you remember the account where Moses, he stood in the gap. He made up the hedge. He stood in the gap and, and prayed that uh, God would not destroy them. In fact, he said, and if not, block me out. And uh, he, he stood in the gap. He made up the hedge, and, and God didn't destroy them. That's what Moses, the man of God, did. Look at Numbers chapter 16 for just a moment. I'm talking about individuals that are just like you and I, that made up the hedge and stood in the gap, and God either changed his mind, if you want to use that, on the punishment that was dealt out, or he forego, he did not bring the punishment that he said that he would. And I know God, he doesn't need to repent. I understand all that. But I'm saying that there was a judgment that was proclaimed, this is coming, and here are men that stood in the gap. They made up the hedge and that judgment did not come. In Numbers chapter 16 and in verse 44, the Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Get you up from among this congregation, that I may consume them as in a moment. And they fell upon their faces. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a censer and put fire therein from off the altar and put on incense and go quickly unto the congregation and make an atonement for them. For there is wrath gone out from the Lord. The plague is begun. And Aaron took as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the congregation. And behold, the plague was begun among the people and he put on incense and made an atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living and the plague was stayed. There was those that died, but they didn't all die. And he, he stood in between. That's Aaron the priest. If you turn a few pages to Numbers chapter 25, here's another account. Phinehas. The Bible says in Numbers chapter 25 and in verse 6, And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought into his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses, into the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation, took a javelin in his hand, and he went in after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through. The man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. This is an individual that stood in the gap that made up the hedge. Ultimately, if you look at Isaiah chapter 59, ultimately it is uh, Jesus in Isaiah chapter 59. And in verse 16, the Bible says in Isaiah 59 verse 16, and he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness, it sustained him. There was no other. And so he, it, Jesus, he's the mediator between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus. He said he looked around, he saw none, so he, he did it himself. In Jeremiah chapter 5, in Jeremiah and in chapter 5, in verse 1, the Bible says, Run ye to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem, and see now, and know, and seek in the broad places thereof, if ye can find a man, if there be any that executeth judgment, that seeketh the truth, and I will pardon it. 
Jeremiah 5.1. You just need to go ahead and mark that down. Run through the streets of Jerusalem. Run through the streets of West Ellick. Run through the streets of Eaton, New Lebanon, Gratis, Lewisburg, Preble County. Run through the streets. If you can find a man that wants to do right, if you can find a man that wants to execute judgment, if you can find somebody that wants to seek truth, he says, I, I'll, I'll pardon him. Pardon what? Pardon the judgment that is coming. Pardon the wrath of God that's coming. Where's it coming, preacher? It's coming on a people that disobey God, turn their heart away from God, that uh, don't observe the Sabbath or don't observe Sunday, that don't observe Wednesday, that don't observe church. The preacher preaches and preaches and preaches. They don't observe that. They don't observe the word of God. They don't observe, thus saith the Lord. They don't observe that this is what you ought to do. They don't observe this is what you ought not do. They, they call evil good and good evil. They profane the holy things. They profane God. They disobey their parents. They oppress the stranger. They oppress the, the widow. They oppress. And they're after gain instead of godliness. See if you can seek somebody and I'll, I'll withhold punishment that is coming. God's looking for a few good men, a few good women, a few young people that are willing to stand in the gap and make up the hedge. And the Bible gives us a count of people that have done that. Now, every gospel preaching, Bible believing preacher down through the years has stood in the gap for that city to withhold evil. Every sold out Sunday school teacher has stood in the gap every Sunday morning, every Sunday school uh, down through the years to just stand in the gap, to make up the hedge. Every faithful child of God has stood in the gap. Has it been easy to get up and go? Has it been easy to, to go to church on Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday school, Sunday night, visitation? Has it been easy? It's been right. It's been the right thing to do. And it's still the right thing to do. To do what? To stand in the hedge. Make up the gap. Just make it up. Just make up the hedge. Stand in the gap. So here's four quick thoughts as we're, we're finishing this evening. What can I do about it? Well, Abraham did a lot about it. So did Moses. Phinehas did something very drastic about it. Aaron did something about it. Jeremiah did something about it. And certainly Jesus did the most, obviously. Amen. But I think every preacher that's been faithful to the word of God down through the years has. I think every Sunday school teacher, God bless your hearts for standing there and preparing and delivering a message without the accolades of man. But God sees it. And every child of God that has been faithful to the word of God, you have made up the hedge. You've stood in the gap. What can I do about it? Lost person knows that it is bad, if you will, the condition of the land. They, they don't have to have a relationship with God to look around and say, uh, this is bad. And it seems like every generation takes it to the next level in a bad way. The Christian knows that it's bad, but ought to be willing to do something about it. So here's four quick thoughts. Number one, see the situation as God sees it. Uh, God's not pleased with what's going on. Whether the media promotes it or whether the culture accepts it, God doesn't. And uh, God's not pleased with it here in America. Abortion is murder. Homosexuality is an abomination and addiction of all kinds destroy people's lives. Of all kinds. See the situation as God sees it. Here's number two. As I see the situation as God sees it, or through the lens of God, through the eyes of God, and you're going to see it through the Word of God, I don't care if they have sex education at the public schools. What's God say about it? And I don't care if they say that uh, cohabiting is okay. It's not. If they say same-sex marriage is okay, it's not. Transgender is okay. It's not okay. 
Drinking's not okay. Smoking's not okay. Those things are not okay. Let, let God have final authority. Right. No matter what the culture says. One, running around half naked is not okay. <coughs> so you see the condition. You see it as God sees it. How am I going to see it? How God sees it? Through the Word of God. Uh, hopefully through the preaching of the Word of God. Hopefully in your Sunday school class as the teacher prepares and preps. And through the Word of God as you are a student of the Word of God. What's God say on this? Uh, not only see the things as God sees it, but uh, number two, flee the sins of the nation. Flee the sins of the nation. That means that you make a new commitment. I am not participating in the sins of the people. I don't care if the majority is saying that it's okay. I'm not doing it. I, I don't care if the majority says that I ought not go to church. I'm going to church. If they say I'm wasting time reading the Bible, I'm not wasting time reading my Bible. And uh, if the majority is not praising God and worshiping God, and serving God, you still serve God, worship God, and praise God. Amen. You do not go with the majority. You go with the minority. It is straight, <clears throat> and it is narrow, and it is right. You flee the sins of the nation. Revelation chapter 18, 4, of course, is your verse. Revelation 18, 4. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 18 and in verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, that is both religious Babylon and its commercial worldly Babylon, my people, Christians, and that, they, that ye be not partakers of her sins. Don't be partakers of her sins so that you do not receive of her plagues. Why? Because judgment's coming. Judgment is coming. Judgment is coming again. And, and you do not participate in that. When you see people doing this and you know God says don't do it, get out of there. You don't do it. Don't participate in the sins of the nation. And then here's number three, very quickly. You look at Jeremiah chapter 30. I said question would be what what can I do about it well you see it as God sees it and then you flee the sins of the nation and you do not participate in it and then in Jeremiah chapter 30 you plead the blood at the throne room of God because you are invited to go there in fact you're commanded to go there that you not only be a student of the word of God but that you be a Christian at the altar of God the throne room of God. In Jeremiah 30 and verse 13, the Bible says, There is none to plead thy cause. Let that not be said of you. There's none to plead thy cause. What if an individual stands before God lost? His name's not written in the book. And it just so happens that there was nobody pleading his salvation. Now he's going to be lost. He's going to die. He's going to go to hell. But wouldn't it be a sad account that the books are open and other books are open, which is the book of life, and they're judged out of those things written in the Lamb's book of life, and there was no Christian that had ever pleaded on behalf of this lost individual. What if the city goes down and there was not a Christian that pleaded for that city? They thought somebody else was going to do it. They thought the preacher was just preaching they thought that was his job. The Bible says, For there is none to plead thy cause, that thou mayest be bound up. Thou hast no healing medicines. That's the balm of Gilead. That's pleading Jesus. It's every child of God ought to be pleading. Every child of God ought to enter into the throne room of God before you pill your head and pray. Pray for your church. Pray for your country. Pray for the lost. Pray for a soul. Give me spiritual children, lest I die be a sad thing for an individual uh, in your family, in your friends, in your co-workers to stand before God at the great white throne judgment and be true that you didn't plead on their behalf. Plead the blood. And then here's last. I said that you would see things as God sees it, that you would flee the sins of the nation, not participate in it, that you would plead the blood of Christ at the throne room of God, 
And then last, that you would be the Christian God wants you to be. Now, preacher, how can I be the Christian God wants me to be? Be involved in, in God's work. Be involved. If you're involved in everything else, you ought to be involved in God's work first. Make sure God's work is first. Make sure God is first, and he'll take care of everything else. Make sure God's work is first. Not only be involved, but be separated from and to, from and to, from and to. Just get it in your mental capacity. From and to, from and to. Separated from and to. From that to Jesus. From that's not right, that is right. Separated. And be faithful. Be able to be counted on. Be able to be counted on faithful to your church, faithful to your calling, faithful to the commission that God has called you to. It's the natural thing to do for a child of God to tell somebody else about Jesus and to want to tell somebody else about Jesus and to have a burden for them. The Christian knows that they ought to be faithful to church, but most won't. But you can. A church is ought to be full right now. I, I understand that churches have personalities, and I understand that there's a church for everybody. Every, every Christian ought to be part of a church. Bible-believing church, Bible-preaching church, but there is a church for everybody. Everybody in Preble County ought to be in church. The churches ought to be full. Uh, there, there's, a, there's enough people in Preble County to fill every church. And every church ought to be full with everybody that I speak to that says that America's in a mess, but they're not in church. That's right. The best thing that they could do is flood the church. Allow God to see it. And then be on God's side. Exodus 32, 26, of course, is your verse. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp, that's standing in the gap, that's making up the hedge, and said, who's on the Lord's side? Boy, that's a pointed and practical question. Who's on the Lord's side? That's black and white. That's either you are or you're not. I love Jesus, then get on the Lord's side. Be on the Lord's side. Be a Bible believer, not a corrector and critic. Be a Bible believer and be a prayer warrior. Uh, be the Christian God wants you to be. Every one of us can be. We, we can do that. God being our helper. Make up the hedge in your home. Child of God, make up the hedge in your home. Listen to me for just a moment in practicality. <clears throat> Maybe everybody in your house is a Christian. Everybody in your house is a person. And everybody in your house that is a person has ups and downs and ins and outs. Uh, be the Christian in your home that makes up the hedge. Stay on top side. Be an encourager. Uh, keep it spiritual. Help somebody until they get back up. Make up the hedge at school. Don't be a follower, be a leader for Jesus. Make up the hedge at work. Be different at work. Don't engage in the wrong things. Make up the hedge in your community. Make a difference. Passing out a track, an invitation, telling somebody about Jesus. Be one of those individuals that make up the hedge and stand in the gap. Let, let's decide this evening again, I want to do that. I, I want to be one of those that make up the hedge and stand in the gap. And, and God will be pleased with that. And God will use that. And you can do it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word of God. Dear Lord, for the encouragement that is contained therein. How individuals that are listed in the Bible have simply made up the hedge and stood in the gap. Dear Lord, we are praying for America as a whole nation. We're praying for our community. We're praying, dear Lord, for the blessings upon this church and upon these families that are represented. Dear Lord, we're praying that lost souls would get saved and for saints would get back encouraged. Dear God, realize we win. Help us to be more on the offense than the defense. Help us, dear Lord, to want to take the gospel to a lost and dying world. Help us to do everything that we can do, and then we'll be glad that we did. We commit this time of invitation over to you, and we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.